This conference will now be recorded. So now, what's the um, what's the weather like out there? Is it freezing cold? It's it's yeah, like it's freezing cold. cold. We just yeah, we just got a uh, a snowfall again last night. So I think it's like negative. No, not negative. I think it's thirteen degrees today. Thirteen. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had a we had a power outage. Um, so the power went out like at maybe six thirty this morning for like blocks of the area that I'm in, which is uh, Lawrence, Kansas. You're in Texas, right? No, I'm in Lawrence, Kansas. Oh, Kansas. Okay, the same thing happened in Texas. My I have two brother-in-laws out there, and I think yeah, my husband was just talking about that this morning. Yeah, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. Everything came back on, so. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, let me go ahead and just kind of dive into it, and and okay. uh, go from there. So, hey, uh, what's going on, everyone? Uh, my name is Pat Brown. I'm a financial advisor here in Lawrence, Kansas, uh, with um, Edmonds Duncan Investment Advisors. Um, been here for many, many years. I uh, went to school at the University of Kansas, played football, and um, was um, had a great time. I met a lot of great people and became very passionate about financial literacy for student athletes, uh, which led me down this path of interviewing former student athletes with the hopes that uh, current student athletes can gain from the successes and failures. Uh, so while going through that process, a lot of things are starting to kind of come down the pipe as far as uh, name, image, and likeness. And so what I wanted to do was start to interview people that are in that space, uh, that space and understand it a little bit more than I do so that we can kind of get this information out to the parents and, and student athletes as well. Uh, so one of the people that uh, I had or came in contact with on LinkedIn, no doubt, um, she has a lot of great information, and I want to make sure I pronounce your name correctly. It's Savania DeBarros. You are super close, Savania. <laughs> yeah, Savania. <laughs> but you like you did really, really good. I was really concentrating good. too. Yeah. I mean, I was like, uh, Savania. Yeah, that okay. was good. That was really good. <laughs> so, Savania, you are um, well, a number of things. When kind of looking at what you've been doing, uh, your title on LinkedIn says protector of athletes. And I know you also host a, a podcast, uh, What Are You Sporting About?, which yeah. is also the title of a book that you wrote, um, as well as you write children's books. I do. I do. So, oh, you yeah. have time for anything else. <laughs> <laughs> right. Almost no time for parenting. <laughs> My goodness. That's a, no, that's that comes cool. first. That comes first. Yeah. So I literally just had this conversation with someone the other day that was like, why did you name yourself protector of athletes? And I kind of went through this whole spill of as the eldest of four kids, I've always kind of been in that protector mode, you know, as a big sister. Um, and it just it just fit me. Um, I had always wanted to represent athletes. I've been representing business owners for a number of years now. But my initial uh, dream of wanting to represent athletes is, was pretty much right out of law school, seeing a, a lot of the bad deals that they were uh, making, bad business decisions that they were making. And that prompted me to really create or have this passion to want to help them. And I was just shut down. So later, um, around 2017, when I had my son, was when I said, OK, this is absolutely what I want to do because it, it just came, it came up again. Yeah. Um, instinctively, it just, it showed up. And so in the midst of that and through working with other business clients over the years, that's basically kind of what I've been talking to them about is protecting yourself. And so hence protector of athletes. Protector of athletes. Well, I liked it. And it's a great, uh, great title. It's catches all get out. And like I said, that <laughs> kind of, you know, made the, uh, the year stand up a little bit when I saw that. Um, and so I kind of touched on this earlier as far as just things that are kind of coming down the pipe and, uh, you know, the more people that kind of have on uh, and hopefully the more, you know, student athletes that are watching this and parents, um, just to gain that exposure to it. So whether it's the space of uh, branding, whether it's the space of, um, you know, name, image, likeness, representation, um, kind of what are your, your thoughts or, or uh, what do you kind of see coming down with regards to this or what's your experience been thus far? I know things are kind of still moving and it's a moving target. Yeah, it's, oh my God. That, you know what, even in the year, it's not gonna be perfect because right now you're dealing with just from an organization standpoint of having rules 
for compliance that these colleges have basically said, okay, if we want to be under this conference, we have to follow these particular rules. But what people don't understand is even those rules aren't, it's not law. Mm. So you're, you're, you're complying because you want to be a part of the school, this organization and this overall conference, but still what are going to, what are going to be the legal implications nationwide and statewide based around name, image and likeness, which is where my expertise comes into play of analyzing all these particular issues, because I am, a lawyer. that's part of what I do is, is look at statute, look at um, a case law and determine kind of how things may actually play out. But I want to back up a little bit because branding, branding is not something I do. I understand it a lot better now as a businesswoman and an entrepreneur. Um, but one thing I would want to say for college athletes or, or kids who are in the space where they're soon to transition to college. So you have some of these high school students. I mean, there are high school students that are probably being looked at for drafting, so to speak, for college, <laughs> you know, right now. And so what they want to think about um, as name, image, and likeness starts gaining speed is what are you doing in your everyday life with your friends on social media, out in public that may kill an opportunity for some form of, of outside business, some, some type of endorsement or sponsorship deal, and not even that, but are you gonna engage in conduct that may actually you know, shine a bad light on you for a college that you're truly interested in? Because sometimes that's the first step too, right? And so I think NIL is now going to have student athletes really create a more entrepreneurial mindset uh -huh. Even much earlier than what was initially anticipated because of the opportunities that can stem from it. And so all of that deals with branding because you want to make sure that you you have a persona that people know, that they trust, um, you're authentic, you're respectful. Um, gosh, I mean, it's, it's, it's so many different, you know, moving pieces for that. And I would sure. definitely say find someone who's a branding agent that can help you set the right course and then just follow, you know, keep following through. That's one thing I've, I've been having to learn about in business, you know, with branding, making sure you build a brand that people know and trust and respect because otherwise you, you know, you lose um, credibility, mm -hmm. you may lose respect. Um, and in this particular sense, you may lose dollars. It, you made a, um... Very interesting point. I, I guess I, I thought about it, but I didn't think about it from the standpoint of, again, you have these kids who are coming to college and yes, they're on social media quite a bit. Uh, but just like you said, if their brand is, or if they don't even have branding and they're doing things that are, uh, let's say, not the best choices, then that could obviously hinder whether it's getting to college or whether it's getting some type of endorsement deal that would right. benefit them and their family uh, later on down the road. So uh, again, hopefully, Hopefully people are listening um, yeah. to make sure that, uh, you know, take care of business. Yeah. Um, and that's so, based on like social media responsibility, right? You know, so yeah. when I was coming up, social media wasn't big like that. I, mm -hmm. what, I think I was, was I in high school with my MySpace? No, I think I was in college when MySpace came out. So, MySpace. Wow. Yeah, that was a big deal back then. So, yeah. you know, people weren't, people still weren't on it like that. So now with so many different things you can do, I think kids are so much more freeing with sharing information about themselves and about their lives and everything they're doing. You have to be so careful because you don't want to turn people off. Um, and I'm trying to pull from my memory bank, but I think there was a, an athlete who did or said something um, that had some racial things tied in. I, I can't remember the name of this athlete, but he was scrutinized so bad because of a statement he made on social media years wow. before. And now yeah. he was a pro athlete. And they're like, okay, this is who you are. And unfortunately, people do judge you, you yeah. know, even if it's something, and I believe people can change, you know, yeah. but even if it's something that you did 
um, 10 years ago and now you happen to be in a situation where people are putting you under the microscope. I mean, that's my job as an attorney. I'm trying to pull everything possible, <laughs> you know what I mean, to discredit you to prove my client's case. And so you want to keep that in mind. And that's why it's important to have responsibility when you're dealing with social media. And uh, we've all done it. I've done it, you know, yeah. gone taken to social media to vent, you know, from time or two. But you have to be so mindful of who's out there watching you and treat it as your business because it can come back to bite you. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I was going to ask, and again, uh, that's a moving target. So it's hard to really determine this, but you know, when these kids start getting into college, how would they even value what their worth is? You know, uh, and even if they do value that worth, you know, as an attorney, or someone that's you know consistently looking at the details, looking at the contracts, you know, how would you protect them? I mean, what I guess what would parents need to kind of understand? Uh, what would you know athletes kind of need to understand as well? Well, let me start off from the parent perspective because, and this is something I talk about in my book, What Are You Sporting About? First mm -hmm. off, remove just that one title of athlete because you're more than the athlete. And when you're looking at NIL opportunities, people are probably gonna come at you from different type of industries that you may have the opportunity to move in another role that is outside of being an athlete, hmm. right? So that's one thing to think about. And I think some parents, especially when you're raising extremely talented athletic kids who have the potential to make it pro, which means that you're probably raising a future millionaire. The, the idea is to push that 100% without developing the other characteristics and aspects of the child that can be as, as you know, equally profitable, if not more, right? Sure. And so I think for parents is um, cultivate the overall child, right? Help them to develop other aspects and characteristics of themselves that will be beneficial to their future as well. Don't put all of their eggs in one basket for them. Don't make them feel like they owe you something for getting them to this point, but just be willing to help develop them, you know, in every aspect. Um, so when that opportunity does come up, they're not searching for who am I? They're, they're not in a identity crisis mode. And so I think right now that's kind of the mold that a lot of people are trying to break out of I've talked to so many athletes, um, those who are in sports, those who are former pros, and the conversations while they're in, in the sport is like they want to keep their contract. Like everyone, almost everyone, I'm not going to stigmatize everybody, but almost everyone is working so hard to keep that next contract or make it to that next contract because there is no plan B, so to speak. You know, yeah. there is no other thing that I can do or that they, don't, they think they can't do. You know, and then for the people who left the sport, it is, what am I going to do now? Or the conversations of, I had to pull myself, you know, up out of this slump and I was depressed and I was this because that's all that they had and all they thought about. And it makes me think, what are parents doing on the front end to help really fully holistically develop these kids so that they know that they are capable and can do more and that they are not just an athlete, but they are multiple things. Um, so from that perspective, parents definitely got to do dig in and, and do the job. Um, and I think that will lead to self-worth and mm -hmm. build out the worth value of that student, student athlete. Um, sure. But from the perspective of the student athlete, figuring out what their worth is in terms of potentially being one of these athletes who receive deals and whatnot, mm -hmm. I think it's going to come down to the very basic of things. You know, how do you perform in school? You know, do you keep, um, are, are you a good time keeping person? Do you schedule properly? Do you follow up with your meetings? Do you keep your word? Um, yeah. Because when we're looking at kids, right? And when I say kids, okay, like 18 to 20. <laughs> <laughs> when we look at kids, and especially if you were in, in a, a very hard sport, um, you may not have time for other things. And so people who are looking to take a chance on you, they're going to look at soft skills. Um, they're going to look at what I think, what your peers say about you, what your 
teachers say about you, what the athletic director has um, seen you do and how you respond to certain things. How do you respond to criticism? Um, do you take what is given to you and it come back, you know, um, with proof that you've worked on something, that you've worked through things? And I think this, this moment is going to, it's going to cut through where athletes have been able to skirt by for a while because there's no such thing as fake it till you make it, right? And I, I know I know this for a fact because when <laughs> I was in the athletic department and I was studying my butt off, some of the other athletes were able to just pass, okay? Yeah. But I was working my butt off. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's not going to be a fake it till you make it. You are going to have to put in the work. And if these people, whoever they may be, give the athlete a chance, they're going to see what you're truly made of. If you haven't had the ability to actually work because of your schedule with being a, a student and an athlete, it's gonna come down to the basics of who you are, all the things that you've shown through the years. Can you can can you step up to the plate and fulfill the roles and the commitments that other people want you to sign on the dotted line for? Yeah. Um, so in in these again whether it's endorsement deals I'm, I'm trying to think the best way to kind of articulate the question but you know in essence these kids are not going to be able to necessarily understand or be able to interpret a, a contract True. if you will um and so the university you know what is the unit is that something that the, would you anticipate the university would step in and say hey look we got so that's a so conflict that's a, of interest that's a Right. So then they are going to have to have some type of representation, you know, through this process, regardless, boy, female, um, you know, what, regardless of what sports, they're going to have some type yeah. of representation. Yeah. And most of, so I've only, I've only reviewed Florida, California, and Colorado statute on NIO. Mm -hmm. All of them involve having legal counsel, having a sports agent. The student can do that. Um, I think currently there are about seven states who have passed NIL, so I'm still pulling the other yeah. states to look at their their statutes and see, you know, is it is it pretty similar? Which, for among the three that I have studied, it's pretty much the same thing written a different way. Um, but athletes are going to have the ability to hire their own counsel, which you really can now. I mean, come on, we have kids who have created businesses. You know, you need counsel, you need some form of agent. But the thing is, if you are one of those students who have gone to college and you're in a state where the age of majority is 18, you still are going to need an adult representative who can sign contracts on your behalf because if you are not the age of majority around the country, you know, common law is you, you don't have the ability to make contracts. I do and, not think about that. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. So you still going to have to have some type of representation, especially like if you're a 17 year old, but you're, you got in college, you know, early, right. you, you going to need somebody to sign a contract for you. If this is something that you're interested in. But I think too, the, the opportunities um, that are intricately woven into an NIL deal is so major because now we're talking about, I mean, we're really talking about intellectual property. Mm -hmm. So in some states there are, and here in Illinois, we have a public right of use statute. Public right of use statute just basically means that no one can go and use my name or, or any depictions of me without written consent. And there are, um, I think there's like a, a fee or something, um, like a penalty fee if someone did. So prime example, I had this attorney reach out to me who he represented a, a, an amazing artist. And she saw a photo of this little girl and she painted the photo and the photo ended up being put into, I think it was the Sable Museum or something out here. Well, the mother of the girl, and she doesn't know these people, but the mother of the girl saw the photo in the museum and they demanded payment and to remove the photo because it's 
child's likeness, right? right? But the caveat is, are you making money off of it, right? So public right of use, you can't use someone's image, likeness, and all that stuff if you're receiving compensation. Gotcha. Well, you have to you have to pay that person and get permission to do so. So that became the question. I wasn't the attorney in this case, um, mm -hmm. so I don't know for sure if she donated it to the museum or if the museum did pay her. Because if there was payment for that, now you are obligated to ask permission and pay what would be reasonable cost to that mother of that daughter, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, same situation with the young lady who reached out to me who was starting a business and wanted to put her grandmother's name on, I think it was like a recipe book, products or something. Well, she's not the direct heir. So the statute also calls for only heirs, the immediate heirs of the person is deceased having the right to utilize that person's name. So now you need to go and talk to your relatives and see if they were, are willing to waive that and allow you to use your grandmother's picture. <laughs> Huh. So that's how NIL is going to get woven into um, public right of use statutes in the different states, depends on where the, the student is registered, you know, for school, but it also may depend on where the student has their home base. So I went to school and say, okay, so I live here in Illinois, but I did go, I grew up in Florida and I went to school at USF. Let's say I grew up in Illinois but I went to school at USF. Illinois has a right of use statute, okay? okay. But say Florida didn't. Well, can I sue someone for illegally using my name, image, or likeness in Illinois? Possibly yes. But then we still have to deal with the fact of where is the other person located as a defendant? Because traditionally, you're supposed to sue a person in the state where they reside. So if Florida, did not, <laughs> if Florida did not have a right of use statute, then, and they lived in Florida, yeah. there may be an argument over whether there will be jurisdiction in Illinois to bring suit. Gotcha. So there's so many, yeah, there's so many different things that can happen. That's why it's important. And I'm glad that the statutes that have been written do call for student athletes to have personal representation because it's gonna be more than just, oh, you get in this deal, um, but we're really looking at a long road of intellectual property being used. Wow. It's a whole can of worms right there. It's a whole can of worms. That's what I'm telling people. I'm like, no one talks about this because no one is coming from a legal perspective. Everybody's looking at the money that can generate um, the pretty stuff, like all the branding around it, but what really happens when you when you get down to brass tacks of protecting these individuals' interests, right? Like protector of athletes, that's a brand name. What are you sporting about? I just got my registration on that. That's intellectual property. You know what I'm saying? And I can enforce that nationwide. So the same, okay, my husband and I just had a conversation a, a while ago. We were talking about Madden. Uh -huh. You know, for years, Madden have all these college athletes yeah. got the bodies moving the same way and everything, right? Yeah. Right. That's that's an infringement. That's the intellectual property infringement. They've never received the right to use the image or likeness of these student athletes to sell all these games. And we know Madden making mad money. Yeah. So now that's something where you're probably going to want to um or their ceo or whoever deals with these issues are going to want to get individual permission from all of these athletes to do so which i would say they they should especially yeah. if there is um a nationwide rules but depending on the state that they're in then that's why i go back there because not all 50 states have public right of use statutes but it may just be something where the student athlete is like yeah don't worry about it i, I love Madden. You know, I definitely want people to see me playing on Madden because maybe it's more brand awareness, right? But then how much more can Madden do with your image? Are you giving them the right to just have your face on like as the, as the moving target in a game? Or are you giving them the right to have your face on the CD? Are you giving them the right to have your face on the cover, on posters for selling it? Like 
there's more to think about when it comes to name, image, and likeness besides just the money that you're receiving up front. Because on the back end, if you don't do this right, you can lose a heck of a lot more. Oh, wow. Yeah, I like what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> you just put on that onion back. Just... Wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, it's deep. I could stay here all day with you talking law about name, image, and likeness, but I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> um so i was trying to look at my my little list of questions i mean i guess you know from um again going back to representation you know these i'm thinking of you know you know the kids that are uh you know come up from a bad background how would mm -hmm. they necessarily you know afford representation at this point or is that kind of still a moving target or how do you i guess I what's your thoughts on that yeah i think it's gonna be um I think it's going to depend mm -hmm. because if you have so in corporate America, we talk about high level employees, low level employees. So let's take that same perspective and, and apply it to sports. So if we have high level athletes, low level athletes, we got low athletes who are maybe they're playing for major universities, but they don't get as much attention. Right. They still mm -hmm. may have the opportunity to leverage their name, image and likeness. So they still, I will still say have counsel, but the branding or opportunity deals that they may receive may not be as much as a high level athlete at the right. same time, right? They all need counsels. So here is, here is what I will tell the athletes to do. First off, if I was a parent of an athlete, mm -hmm. I would already start scouting attorneys who have the ability or some form of knowledge on business law um mm -hmm. if they have separate understanding of intellectual property law that would be great too but i will also look for someone who have um, some trial experience at least dealing with contracts or business litigation issues why this is important because i have actually litigated cases where contracts were drafted by attorneys who only were transactional attorneys meaning they sit behind a desk and just you know drafted documents never went to court and that's a problem because if you don't know what um issues are being argued time and time again in court you're bound to make the same mistake in drafting a contract for somebody else and not pulling in those things that can hopefully shield your client from potential litigation i'm not saying that you may not go to court you may but still it's good to have that experience so that's number one um Number two, when you're searching for attorneys, depending on whether you're a high level performing athlete or low level, looking, look and see, okay, what type of deal am I really shooting for? Because if it's a high, it's a, if it's a high generating deal, then you may be able to find counsel who would do the contract on a contingency basis. That's very not, not, um, it's not often done in contract cases because you know it's not like a personal injury type matter. But yeah. if it's if it's going to generate a high level of income, then that might be something where the attorney may be willing to take a contingency fee while they go through the whole negotiation process to the final deal until the you know the payment is made. On the other end, if you are a low generating or low performing athlete, but still coming from a, a good place, like a really good strong school, and you have some interest, then I would probably say look for attorneys who um, are structuring with flat fees, or um, maybe you can work with them on a limited basis. So maybe you pay them a fee to do certain things for you. So that way you're not getting into the issue of this large retainer fee mm -hmm. where you're having to try to maintain that, but the deals that you're getting are not, it's not enough overhead to help you to maintain that retainer over time. So gotcha. that's one of the things that I've, I've done um, actually in the last, I think it's about four years now, was changed the structure of my plans, my fees for my clients, because especially think about this as a business owner, you're able to stay on track financially if you know what you're spending. Right. But when you're paying an attorney on an hourly basis, which is traditionally what happens, 
that cost can fluctuate month by month. You have no idea what you would be spending. And so with my new structure, what happens is depending on where the client is coming from. So are they a business client, just straight business? Are they an athlete or are they a student athlete? Um, and then this is going to depend on too, what is the amount of the deal? Like how much work? Because sometimes the amount of the deal is going to cost more because you got to put more work in. Okay. You got to put more work in. So looking from those perspectives, it's like, okay, based on the type of client I have, the amount of the deal, what monthly rate can I give them? Because if you're on a monthly rate and I'm working with you on a regular basis, you know for sure what you can afford, what your fee is, and you can make that, that uh, obligation. If it's a high generating contract and it's something where I'm like, okay, well, this may be worth putting the, the work in up front and getting paid on the back end, then there may be an agreement where we can do a contingency or maybe we can do a combination of a contingency and a flat fee, you know? So it just depends, but I would I would definitely say, look for those things. So just to recap, parents look for attorneys uh, with contract business representation experience, probably some um, type of trial experience. Uh, athletes need to be looking for attorneys who may be willing to work on a contingency basis or a limited scope basis with flat fees. You're muted. I can't hear you. Well, let me see what happened. I can't hear you at all. That is so weird. I literally heard you before and now you're not. Hold on. Okay. Okay, I just changed my speaker so I could hear you. Change your microphone settings and see if that works. You can hear me though, right? Huh? Oh, there you go. Okay, perfect. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, that was strange. Um, that was very strange. Uh, but I guess what I was going to say is I, you know, definitely uh, appreciate your time. Um, you know, take some time to kind of talk about this and dive into it more. I'd love to, you know, maybe as time goes on, you know, maybe uh, come back yeah. and kind of, uh, do it again because I just think, you know, knowledge is power. And I think uh, we can, you know, certainly expose the parents and kids to this information. It's, it's going to be key. So, yeah you know what i think would be a good idea is um so i'm, I'm launching my book this summer i don't know which month yet just kind of depending on how far i get but um so i would i would think doing like i wouldn't say every two weeks so that's just too much maybe every month every two months sure excuse me maybe we can that's do like a panel thank you a panel with parents um doing one issue one issue on the call because it can get so convoluted yeah and you just don't want to lose people <laughs> because you're gonna have to deal now you got you're gonna have issues of compliance you know how's the school gonna deal with compliance and the student athlete and one thing that i do address in my upcoming book is what happens if the student um, has a deal on the table that the school didn't already have a deal with and then they come in and get a deal and say that the, the um, athlete is in violation of the rules? Yeah. That's not fair, right? No. So, you know, it's like how do you advance your rights over that to say, no, I had this deal first. There was not a, a 
a compliance issue until you guys went out and also um, created a relationship with this other third party. Yeah. So that's that's crazy. That's why people need counsel. Yeah. But, okay. <laughs> you know, we thought of last, so. <laughs> oh, we thought of last too. Financial advisor, so we're getting live. <laughs> That is true. That is true. But um, so do you mind sending me this recording though? This would be great. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll send this over to you. Okay. okay. All right. But yeah, keep me posted. Whatever I can do to be a resource, happy to do it. All right. Well, again, I appreciate the time. Now I'll, I'll put links for your book uh, down below okay. and and uh, we'll go from there. there we'll go cool, from there. Cool, cool. All right. Good, good. You too. Talk to you soon. Yep. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.